What's cracking, everybody? Money Smart Guy Matt Paul here. Haley Tier from Dallas, Texas. And in this episode, we're going to be sharing seven things that you need to know about 401ks, life insurance, and annuities, especially right now during these crazy times and a pending recession looming around the corner. We put together a compilation of some financial legends, best selling authors, Tom Hegna and Douglas Andrew, to break these down. So, with that being said, break out those notebooks. Let's get started. Let's check this out. Gotcha. So look, when we when we unpack that uh, this conversation, so oftentimes people come into the conversation and hey, you know, life insurance should never be an investment. Life insurance should be separated from your your four hundred one k, all those different things. What would you say to those folks who are having that type of discussion with their financial professionals? Yeah, because unfortunately, um, in the financial services industry, Matt, and uh, I've been around a long time. Um, just a little bit. Yeah, uh, just about 47 years now. And, it, and it's interesting because the financial services industry, because of whatever, um, they say, well, you can't call insurance an investment. Mm -hmm. I go, well, that's okay with me because apparently investments... Uh, can uh, you can experience losses, and that's uh, unacceptable to me. So, so I'm glad it's not called an investment. Uh, apparently, investments sooner or later are taxed. So I don't want one of those. What I want is a vehicle that is far superior. So many times I'll say, <clears throat> well, what would you call something that you put money into it's not an investment, but you put money into this thing, and it's an it's a incredible vehicle, and it, it accumulates tax-free at really good rates of return, not pie in the sky, but average rates of return of 7 to 10%, which is the equivalent of getting 15% or more in a tax-deferred IRA or 401k. And uh, <clears throat> when the market goes up, when the economy is up, you get to participate, but when the market goes down, you don't lose, because <laughs> your money's not at risk in the market. So you can earn average rates of return of 7 to 10%. If you know rule of 72, you divide your, your interest rate into 72 and it tells you how fast your money doubles. So your money's going to double every 7 to 10 years. So if you put in, let's say, $500,000, I don't care if it's 500 bucks a month. 500 bucks a month will grow to over a million bucks in 30 years with those kinds of rates of return. But uh, older people, a half a million, okay, they, it doubles to a million every seven to 10 years. That million doubles to two million and another, and, and two million doubles to four million, four million doubles to eight million. We actually have clients who started out with just 500,000. Now that's a lot of money, but they spent quite a while accumulating that. They now have $8 million generating uh, 600,000 to 800,000 a year tax-free if they live to be 120. So here is this uh, instrument, financial vehicle. You put money into it, accumulate your money tax-free. It allows you to access money tax-free and not outlive your money if you live to be 120. And when you die, whatever's left in there blossoms and increases in value and transfers income tax-free. Now, whenever I ask audiences that question, what would you call something that does that? Predictably, yeah. it's usually people on the front row yell out, a miracle, <laughs> a godsend in this topsy-turvy world of unpredictability that we're in. I go, yep, uh, but you don't call it an investment. It's way better than one of those. And they go, golly, I've never heard of this before. How does it work? Yeah, it works really well for all kinds of financial goals. And so that's why I often re uh, compare it to uh, like a financial Swiss army knife. You can use it for retirement and college funding and emergency funds and working capital for business. Uh, real estate equity management, as you know, uh, and uh, estate planning. I mean, you can use it for so many purposes because it's the dream solution when you understand how to structure it correctly and fund it properly. Well, it, it's interesting because uh, the real estate strategies only comprised about 25% of my book, but it was such a big aha because I've always taught my clients how to manage their real estate equity. And sometimes their only piece of real estate is their own home mm -hmm. uh, with strategies on how to get out of debt at least two and a half years faster than any method of sending extra principal payments to the mortgage company. No, you want to put it over here in a side fund. Well, what side fund? Well, a maximum funded indexed universal life was a superior side fund that passed liquidity, safety, and rate of return tests with flying colors. 
And my my first chapter was the back then was the twenty five thousand dollar mistake being made by millions of Americans. And I I actually prove that if you socked away the money that you would send against your mortgage into an insurance contract, you'll have enough money in the insurance contract with compound interest tax free that'll pay off uh, a 30 year mortgage in 12 and a half years instead of uh, what people were touting. Oh, we can get your house paid off in 15 or 20 years. And people just don't think about it, but it also gives you the ability to access money in an emergency like happened in 2009 when real estate values went down, people sometimes criticized me and said, oh, neener, 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 Mr. Andrew, uh, you're underwater. You owe more than your house is worth. Did I care? No, I have never missed a mortgage payment because I had liquid cash over in my insurance contract that I could take out and make a mortgage payment. People who paid all that extra principal against against their mortgage they and their house went down in value, they lost everything they gained over five or 10 years of extra principal payments. So it sort of got the attention of a lot of people back then. And still there's a lot of people don't, that don't get it. But the other three fourths of the reason why I use max funded indexed universal life is for retirement planning, emergency funds, working capital for business, becoming your own banker, college funding. I mean, it knocks the socks off of a 529 college plan. So that's why in my newest book, uh, the right brain side has 12 chapters that talk about all kinds of ways you use indexed universal life for goals other than just retirement. But retirement is one of the big ones. A lot of people are, they swear by their 401k. And, and this crazy adoption is I'm gonna embrace my 401k and all the different funds that's underneath it. But they never ever introduce a, an annuity component. You know, and, and I think only recently that they started including, I think Obama even yeah. even said it's some, from the annuity component should be in some people's it should be. 401k. But here's know, how I handle the 401k. When, when somebody says, hey, I got a million bucks in my 401k, I say, great, how much of that is yours? They go, what do you mean? It's all mine. I go, it's not yours. You got a partner. In fact, you're the limited partner. The general partner is the federal government. And you have no idea how much they're going to take from you. Like right now it's 38, 39% they're going to take. What happens when it goes to 50, 60, 70% like in the past or up to 90% as we did in the 1950s, yeah. the marginal tax rate was 90%. You have no idea how much of that money is yours. Why don't you put it into something that you can control that, 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 you know it's yours, but that 401k, you have no idea how much of that money is yours. So, so here's what I say, 401ks made sense when tax rates were coming down. You know, you, you, you get a tax deduction up here, it grows tax deferred and you retire and you pay tax down here. But we know tax are gonna have to go up. So how much sense does it make to take money out of your check today, mm -hmm. defer that baby till taxes go up to 50, 60%, then I'm gonna take it out and pay, that doesn't make any sense. So what I tell people is, is, is this, you sit down with your client, say, does your company have a 401k? Yes. Does it have a match? Yes. Explain the match. Well, if I put in 4%, they match with 4%. Okay, good, I do that, that's 100% rate of return. But above the match, I wouldn't put in my 401k anymore. I would put that into cash value life insurance because I wanna be in control, I wanna have tax, free income in retirement. And that 401k and that IRA, those are gonna be like chains around people's necks. They're gonna regret that they put as much money in those products as they did. Benefits, healthcare, and a 401k. You got a great chapter here on 401k and IRAs. Why would you never put your money inside a 401k and IRA after knowing what you know? <laughs> yeah, well, I'll tell you what, <laughs> two reasons. First of all, uh, IRAs and 401ks were built on the premise of a tax deferral and 91% of Americans still put their money, I think they're duped into putting money into IRAs or 401ks, being told they're gonna be in a lower tax bracket when they retire. Matt, that has not been true or axiomatic for over 25 years. It took the financial services industry uh, until two or three years ago to finally admit, oh, most people who save anything uh, are not in a lower bracket when they retire. They're going down the highway uh, towards financial uh, security, financial independence with one foot on the gas pedal and the other foot on the brake pedal, and they don't know they're doing it. Uh, they're socking away money in a tax deferred account, and then they're killing their deductions as they go. That's the foot on the brake. Uh, they pay off their house. They don't have that deduction. The kids are now gone later in life, or if they're not gone, you can't deduct them anymore. 
Um, and then you, uh, you're not contributing money to IRAs or 401ks that you don't have that deduction. If you're a business owner, you have th those deductions. And, uh, and then Congress keeps raising taxes. I mean, this $6 trillion stimulus, mm. taxes are going to be going through the roof. Okay. That is twice as much money as the IRS collects in, in, in taxes in an entire year. And they're, they just passed to give it out, you know, the free money to help people. And I'm, I'm saying that's okay. But that's not free money. We're going to be paying that back. And so what should you be doing right now? There is there are opportunities. But no, I will never own an IRA or 401k or a Roth. Now, some people say, what? A Roth? Well, a, a Roth is a step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. But a Roth only has two advantages. If you think uh, future taxes are going to be higher, uh, like the CBO, Congressional Budget Office, and the General Account uh, Accountability Office, they estimate that because of this stimulus, let alone 50% of voters in this country want uh, Medicare for all and, and free college. If that ever happened, they say taxes would have to go to 50, 60, or 70%. Let's say it's 50%. Would you rather get the taxes over and done with on your IRA or 401k? While your values are less and taxes are the lowest tax rate they will probably ever, ever be? Or do you want to uh, wait until it comes back up to the high water mark that you were at mid-February when the Dow almost hit 30,000? And then in 30 days later, mid-March, the Dow is, is down to around 20,000. It's now around 23,000 or so. But I mean, people saw a 33% loss in 30 days. That spells opportunity. Opportunity, and I've been showing this opportunity uh, on webinars for the last three weeks and people are blown away. And so uh, Roth has two advantages. Uh, you take after tax money, it accumulates tax free. You can take it out tax free. And a maximum funded indexed universal life has those two advantages. They've been around forever, but it has four additional advantages. Yeah. I can throw in, if I'm a business owner and I've structured it correctly, I can throw in uh, 300,000 into my laser fund. And four days later, if I need 250 grand back, I can get it back out. I can't do that with a Roth. Uh, you would incur all kinds of penalties. You can't even put that much money in. In fact, the laser fund is what I call the maximum funded index universal life. CPAs, savvy CPAs and tax attorneys, they call it the rich man's Roth. And I snicker, you don't have to be rich to have one, but the rich can't own a Roth. And so um, you, you can put in large amounts if you could put in a uh, hundred or two hundred or three hundred thousand into your universal life, uh, index universal life, and, and you only put in ten or twenty thousand in future years, you can make up for the for the room you didn't use. You can't do that in a Roth, but I can access money out of my insurance contract for any reason whatsoever. I don't have to wait five years or till I'm fifty nine and a half. But there's not a Roth around that if I if I died tomorrow on the freeway. Every million that I might have in my universal life insurance contracts would blossom to two and a half million right now at my age of 67 <laughs> uh, and transfer tax free. Oh, is that? Roth around that will do that. So my question always is, once I help people understand that, I go, why would I ever own a Roth when I can have all the benefits of a Roth and four additional benefits that Roth will never have? And it's totally tax free. And it's been that way long before Roths were passed in 1997. So other than that, I don't have any strong feelings on the subject. Not at all. I couldn't tell. Because, you know, you got the Dave Ramseys of the world. You got the Susie Ormans of the world. And they're always talking about buy term invest their friends. And he has his own term insurance company that he, he will refer you to as well, if, if you want to quote. So, so how do we put that argument to have a different light because it seems to be end all be all only 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 by term yeah well um first of all i agree with a lot of dave ramsey says cut up your credit cards stay out of debt i, I agree with that but the, the life insurance he gets totally wrong and, and i tell people this very simply you've been told a lot of stuff about life insurance let me share with you the ultimate truth because here's the ultimate truth the only policy that matters is the one that's in force on the day that you die Less than 2% of term policies are ever in force on the day that you die. Now, that doesn't mean term is bad. What that means is term is there when the kids are little, when the bills are high, when the paycheck is low, you buy term insurance to get adequate coverage. But if term is your only policy, 
You're going to die with zero life insurance in force over 98% of the time. You can't use term to leave a legacy to your children if you're you know, 70 and 80 years old and die. No, term, term's too expensive. You have to cancel it. You can't use term for some business. Can't use term for estate planning. So this whole thing that only term, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Term only pays if you die young. And then his thing is, well, you won't need life insurance when you're older. You're going to be rich. You're well, self-insured. I yeah. can prove that one wrong because who buys the biggest policies? Old rich people do. See, if Dave was right, old rich people wouldn't buy any life insurance. They buy the biggest policy. So he's dead wrong on that. So, Doug, when you're looking at strategies that was really became very popular in the 70s and 80s, which was buy term and invest the difference, which still today is still an ongoing argument with all the information education that's still out there, still arguing that this financial concept is still a solvent strategy. Well, I think, you know, there's a lot of people out there just unaware of the other side. So what would you say to those critics of the buy term and invest a different? I ended up uh, being responsible for over 3,000 clients in 13 Western states. And you know, we were trying to do a good job uh, selling them term insurance and putting the difference into uh, mutual funds. And, and it was a sort of like a forced investment because a lot of people don't even invest the difference. Okay. <laughs> And <clears throat> the whole theory was, uh, if you listen to the Dave Ramseys and the Susie Ormans, well, when you accumulate uh, enough, uh, at the end of the day, you won't need insurance anymore when it gets expensive. Mm -hmm. When Universal Life came out in 1980, E.F. Hutton was the brainchild of that, okay? They weren't in an insurance company. And they were the ones who said, wait a minute, <clears throat> we're out here. Did you ever play red light, green light when you were a kid? Sure. Okay. So the stock market, we had money in, in, in mutual funds, and it was like playing red light, green light. So there were some periods where you might uh, take 20 steps forward. You get 20% return, but then the next year, you have to take you know, 10 or 15 steps back, up and back, up and back. The stock market is like a person with a yo-yo, maybe hopefully walking up some stairs, let's say. Well, when Hutton realized the average rate of return, even if you earned 12%, Let's say you finally accumulate a million dollars in a retirement nest egg and you're only 12%. That's 120 grand a year. You pull out 120,000, uh, you're taking 12 steps forward, you're taking four steps back in tax, between federal and state tax. You take another step back in fees because they're charging 1% on that million. You're netting seven, even though you're grossing 12. Do you know what most people actually earn with their money in the market because they get invo involved in emotion? They, they watch, like in 2001 to 2003, they watch the market go down, 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 and they finally say, enough already, and they sell. They sell low, and then they wait, 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 and they buy high. So Dalbar, who studies investor behavior, says the average, especially retiree, only is earning 3.5%. This is what precipitated the 4% rule in the financial services industry. So they're not earning 12. You got a million bucks, you pull out 4%. Uh, that's 40 grand. You pay tax in a 25% bracket of 10,000. Now you're netting 30. Now, what, what about the 1% fee on that? That's another 10 grand. Y you're living off of 2% or 3%. I don't know if you're like me, but I don't accumulate a million bucks to have a measly 20 or 30,000 net to buy gas, groceries, prescriptions, and golf green fees. That's pretty pathetic. With my index universal life, I was able to uh, participate in the market without the risk. When the market went up, I'm able to earn. When it goes down, I don't lose because of indexing. So in answer to your question, <clears throat> by having my money there, I'm able to earn average returns. Uh, conservatively, I've earned 8.2% net cash on cash. So a million dollar nest egg can generate 80,000 a year of tax-free income. Whereas most IRAs and 401ks, you're gonna be lucky in the market to net uh, to, to earn four and net three or two because of the taxes. And so <clears throat> when Hutton came out with it, I went, this is buy term, invest the difference on steroids. People don't invest the difference. If I maximum fund it, my cash value pretty soon uh, equals the death benefit and pushes it ahead. So the cost of the insurance, hear this, gets cheaper as you get older. And people go, what? I've never seen an insurance policy that gets cheaper as I get older. Well, you haven't seen one done correctly then. Because my universal life policies that are 30 years old cost less than 1 20th what they did when I was 30 years younger. Because 
cost of insurance per thousand goes up, but the amount of insurance that's at risk with the insurance company is going down. If I earn 10% this year, I would net 10 point, I, I, would, I would net 9.9 .9 because the cost of the insurance has gotten cheaper as I've gotten older because I'm self-insuring. So this whole argument of Dave Ramsey, Susie Orman, oh, 20, 30 years from now, you won't, um, you won't need the term insurance when it gets expensive because you'll have the money. Well, universal life, you have the money sometimes as soon as 15 years, and you're self-insured. I'm using it for living benefits, and when I die, it will blossom and transfer tax-free. But when uh, Hutton came out with that, oh, let's take the least amount of insurance we can get away with in the Internal Revenue Code and put in the most money, and pretty soon you are self-insuring in as little as 15 years. You put in 500,000, the minimum death benefit for a 60-year-old is a million two fifty. Your 500,000 is going to exceed a million two fifty in less than 15 years of the growth. So it's like, and now when the cash value grows to 2 million, the death benefit stays ahead by 5%. The insurance company is only charging you for the remaining amount, 100,000 at risk. This thing is a tax-free cash cow. And people uh, get hung up on what it is instead of what it does. Here's what we're hearing on the street. The typical buyer says, oh, oh, we don't know if it's a recession yet. We don't know if it's a recession yet. Just sit and wait. Hold on, hold on, hold. How, how would you address that? Especially if that was your mother sitting across the table in this conversation. Okay. This is where so many times, and I've been around the block in this industry for over 45 years, okay? So I, I've lived through several recessions, the 1980 and, and, and the 1987 and, and so forth. So let me tell you. The worst 10 year period or actually 12 year period since the Great Depression was 2000 to 2012. Now, uh, most Americans, see you'll, most decades have seven gain years compared to three down years. That decade, there were five loss years. So um, <clears throat> most Americans, if they had accumulated a million bucks by the year 2000 without adding a dime, they saw that million dollar nest egg dwindle after 2001 to 2003 down to 600 grand. It took four years until 2007 to make back the loss because a 40% loss has to be followed by a 67% gain just to get back to break even. Mm -hmm. And so people felt like they'd lost their future. They had to put off retirement seven years. They got, they got paralyzed. I'm gonna tell you what I was advising people in 2001, two and three, because in 2008, what happened? As Warren Buffett put it, when the tide went out, it revealed who was swimming naked is what he said. And so uh, a lot of people lost 40% again for the second time in a decade. And it took four years until 2012 to get back to break even. So finally, 2012, they've got their million dollars back again. The lost decade. Using indexing, okay? Uh, most of our clients had tripled their money in that 12 year period. A million in 2000 was worth 3 million. In fact, um, just using indexing and never rebalancing uh, in that uh, decade from 2000 to 2010, the five down years you don't lose, of course. Zero was hero. Right. The five up years, only two times did you cap out, but the average was 7.23%. The caps on our universal life policies we owned were around 16 to 17% of the time. Now, most people, because because I didn't earn zero all five years, I, I just switched back over and earned the uh, insurance company's general account portfolio rate back then of 5%. So I only had two years of zero, three years of 5%, and the other years I participated in the index. So what was I telling people in 2001 to 2003 when the markets nosedive? I mean, what did I tell them in 2008? Here is your opportunity. And that's what I'm telling people right now. Okay. Let's, let's say, let's say somebody had uh, in, in February 15th of this year, $900,000 in their IRAs and 401ks in the market. And by mid March, it was down to 600,000. Mm. What do most people do? They listen to their advisor that says, hang in there, hang in there. The mark and, and they want to wait until the market comes back up to the high water mark of 900 grand again before they do anything. They get paralyzed. And I'm going, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. When it's only worth 600,000, 
why not get the taxes over and done with when it's only worth 600,000, then wait till it gets back up to 900. Why? Because you pay tax on 600,000. Let's say in a 33% bracket, you pay tax of a third on 600,000. People go, <gasps> no, pay it. What do you have a net of? Four, 400. Where should you put that? See, the key strategy is get the taxes over and done with while values are lower and tax rates are lower and then reposition. Number two, reposition the after-tax IRA 401k money into a vehicle that's going to be tax-free from now on. And then the third strategy is use indexing. So the next time the market crashes, you don't lose. But see, you're getting the taxes over and done with at uh, what a $200,000 tax bill. Let's say you hang in there and it gets back up to 900,000 again and Congress has to raise taxes to 50% because it's gotten them done with at 33% because they have to they have to fund this economic stimulus and all this stuff that's been going on. So now you have 900,000 uh back in your IRA or 401k and you're in a 50% tax bracket. What's 50% of 900? 450. You're only netting 450,000. And my laser fund, my insurance contract is, is, has got 600,000 in it. It's 150,000 better off. It's not subject to market volatility and it's totally tax free. Now is a huge opportunity. We're helping people. We call these strategic rollouts. And I have a whole, I have a whole chapter on it in my book. Yeah, I think part of the big must understand is two things. You know, the, 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 the experts, you know, whatever you call them, they say all the news, they, blank, they can make a blanket statement without understanding that there's different segments of a news. Yeah. It's the same thing to do with life insurance. They yep. do the same thing. Yep. What, what I also see them do is they say, oh, you know, there's a lot of charges with inside annuities. And, they're, and what the, right, we ask, hey, what do you point towards? They point to the surrender charges. So what's some of the mis misunderstandings so I, I charges say, with the annuities? I told my clients the surrender charge is a big positive. The only reason that the insurance company can offer you all these these things that you get this upside, you get no downside, you can do this, you can turn it in income, is because there are surrender charges. Mm -hmm. If there weren't surrender charges, they'd have to pay you 0.10 like their money market. Your money market fund doesn't have surrender charges, it's paying yeah. you 0.10. Yeah. You want 0 0.10, no surrender charge, that's a money market fund. You want to get these benefits? They've got to have a way to know that they're going to keep that money for five or six or seven years. It's not a negative. You can still take 10% out penalty free. You have access to money. Yeah. You just that's that's how the that's how these products work. Yeah, and don't, they don't really get you triggered. pay zero. I've yeah. got surrender charges on all my news. I'm going to pay zero surrender charge because I'm not going to surrender them. I'm going to use them the way I'm supposed to. Damn. You turn it into income. There's no surrender charge. Yeah, you can turn that thing into income tomorrow. There's no surrender charge. So, and sometimes people get you know, they, they they get annuity and then they listen to the stock market guys, and you know for for the people that have a you know they, they pay the one or two percent whatever the cost of the income rider is, but they, again. Well, it's an expensive, and I don't want to pay a top of those fees. What would you say? Some is it? Is it a beneficial benefit? The lifetime income rider. Yeah. So fees only matter in the absence of value. The only time fees matter is if there's no value. But if 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 that benefit is a value to them, then the fee doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter if you're going to get two thousand dollars a month, and that's what you want. That's what you need. It doesn't matter that 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 there was a 1% fee attached to that if it's guaranteed for the rest of your life and that and you can't go anywhere else and get $2,000 a month guaranteed for the rest of your life, what difference does it make what the fee is? Correct. It doesn't good. matter. Yep. Doug, that's insurance. It, and people think, that, goodness gracious, that's not investment, that's insurance. So, Doug, the stereotype says, well, the only people that really make money with life insurance are people that are commissioned to make money selling it. You know, so, but the flip side to that is, well, you don't think that people at the fund manager, they don't charge you a fee? The worst, worst about that is they charge you a fee, not only in the good times, but also in the bad times. So when you're losing money, they're still charging you a fee. How would you respond to those? Thank you for asking that question because, you know, a lot of times critics will talk about, oh, the fees, insurance, uh, uh, you have uh, maybe a, a front loaded commission or something. And I'll go, okay, let's use a comparison here. If somebody came to me, and it, it doesn't matter if they're going to sock away 500 bucks a month or whether uh, a lot of our clients are already, you know, 55, 60 years old, and, and now they maybe painted themselves into a tax trap, is what we call it, and uh, they're not in a lower tax bracket. In fact, 
I don't think people who accumulate very much of a respectable retirement nest egg are, are in lower tax brackets when they retire. Now, so they start pulling money out of their traditional IRAs or 401ks and they're getting taxed to death and they pay back every two and a half or three years. Uh, 100% of the tax they saved over 30 years on the contributions. And they're thinking, whose retirement uh, was I planning anyway? Mine or Uncle Sam's. So <clears throat> the critics who say, well, you are selling an insurance policy that has uh, a, a front end load. Well, if I had a client putting in 500,000, my compensation might be, let's say $20,000 but it's usually paid for out of a minuscule portion of money that would otherwise have gone out the window in unnecessary income tax. I got a commission on the front money that went in. I never made a dime off of what my client's cash grew by year by year by year. So <clears throat> asset managers, they usually charge, let's say, 1% or more on the asset management. And they'll keep making that. If you put a half a million dollars with an asset manager, and if it was earning as good of a rate of return as my index universal life has between seven to 10% average, uh, by the time you retired, let's say 30 years down the road, you know what an asset manager would have charged you in fees? Just barely under $1 million. <laughs> now, let me use the metaphor. So <clears throat> if I went to, um, uh, as a realtor, let's say, to, to uh, sell or buy, help you find a home to buy. And I said, listen, I can find you a really good home and uh, you have a choice. You can pay me a one-time fee of 20000 or even 30000 Let's say on a half million dollar home, that'd be 30000 Six percent is a normal realtor's fee, right? Okay. So <clears throat> you can either pay me one time 30000 or this is really what I want you to do. Uh, I want to charge you 1% on the price of that home, the value of that home, as it goes up in value every year for the next 30 years. Wh which one do you want? <laughs> and anybody with any smarts goes, uh, I'll do the one time and let my house appreciate and go from 500,000 to a million to 2 million to 4 million to 8 million. I mean, hello. So it's probably one of the most inexpensive financial plans ever. You don't choose investments based upon um, which ones grow to the most or cost the least at the outset. You choose investments based upon which ones will generate the most at the time in life you're going to be using the money the most down the road. And a maximum funded indexed universal life is the cheapest product at the end of the day of any financial instrument that does what it does. But the industry has yeah. this economic structure we have in terms of entrepreneurship yeah. has, it's allowed me to become financially free, financially independent. Yeah. And so when, when you're looking at um, the, the, our, our, our agency and we're teaching insurance, we're teaching annuities and we're teaching entrepreneurship, you know, we find that as a blend of, of, of what we're doing. And I see the insurance industry lacking in demand. So yeah. the last question I wanna ask you is, you're an industry guy. You're an advocate for for our industry. Uh, we need more bodies in this, in this yep. field. We need yep. more people to be helping and serving other people. What would you say to those who are in the midst of this great resignation era and, and why should they consider the insurance industry? Well, I'd, I'd say this. Um, being in the insurance industry is a terrible job if you just want to make $30,000 a year. I wouldn't do it. I'd go change tires at Discount Tire. But if you want to make 150, 200, 300, 400,000, it's, I believe, the easiest, fastest way to get there. You don't have to buy a McDonald's franchise. You don't have to spend millions of dollars on franchise materials and equipment and property and rentals and all that, hiring people. You can do it yourself. So I, I just think the entrepreneurial, if they come in with an entrepreneurial spirit that they want to be a business owner, uh, you can make a lot of money. If you think you're going to come in and be an employee, you're going to be pretty miserable, I think. So I told my people, if you don't want to make you know, six-figure income, mm, I don't know if this is what you should be doing. I think you should maybe do something else. But if you really want to make six figures, I can show you how to do that. Yeah, I mean, if you Google the industry most likely to make you a millionaire, number one at the top is financial services. Check yeah. it out. Don't, it's not my website. <laughs> you go check out the site. So, Tom, I appreciate yep. your time, your Thank energy. Thank you, Matt. Sure thing, though. 
And Doug, there's a lot of people, as you have saw and witnessed here at our event today, which they love seeing you on stage and you rock the stage. What would you say to the newest person that's getting involved in the life insurance industry? They're a brand new agent, they just got licensed, or they're thinking about getting licensed here in short order. What would you tell them about how to establish your careers? You've done this now for 47 years. How would you tell them to get their business up off the ground? First of all, congratulations. Uh, you have no idea how much of a meaningful transformation you will create for your clients. And if you take this serious and don't listen to the naysayers and um, you begin to learn, empower yourself with knowledge, and then knowledge times experience gives you the wisdom. There's no greater payday, not financially, but when live or die, those people that you're helping to transform themselves financially, to be able to make sure that they cannot outlive their money in retirement. And that if they happen to die prematurely with what we call an untimely death, to be able to deliver a tax-free death claim and say, here, you, your financial house was in order like I did when my brother passed away. I never dreamed he would be using the universal life policy I sold him as a death benefit. I thought we were going to ride Harley Davidsons and, and, and go river rafting uh, into the twilight of life. Doggone it, he got to graduate before I did. He was just 50 years old. But his sweet wife has been able to live in dignity for 25 years now because of that death benefit. But to the new agents, you will transform people's lives, not just financially. But if you are sincerely interested in your clients and you do what's best for them, it's like Zig Ziglar used to say, you help enough other people get what they want, you're going to get everything in life that you want and uh, stick to it. I, I loved um, your interview with Tim Tebow uh, last night because I've had many setbacks in my life and I've learned most from my negative experiences but you cannot have a great comeback unless you have a setback. And so don't get discouraged. Uh, if I threw in the towel the first time I had a setback, um, I hate to think what I would be doing instead of transforming people's lives. Don't get discouraged. Hang in there. Gain wisdom and knowledge. And go out and change people's lives. And you will be compensated financially, but in way more uh, impactful uh, ways than just the money. The reward is unbelievable to help people optimize all of their assets. And, and that's not just the money. Uh, that's helping them to have the confidence to be healthy, uh, to not ever have to worry about the money because now they can go out and be uh, with their family. Uh, they can have health. You, you, many insurance agents never really get their arms around the, the impact that they have on people's lives. So, Stay with it. Don't get discouraged. Um, as you begin to progress, um, as you know, Matt, and you're a great example of this. Looking back, um, I do not regret one minute being in this business. It's one of the most prestigious careers I could ever choose. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. What were you studying in college, Doug? <laughs> What was I studying in college? I was studying to become an attorney. Yeah. And this was a means to that end. And then most attorneys were like, <clears throat> uh, if, if, if we had to do it over again, we'd rather go out and do what you're doing. Yeah. What would you tell somebody who's in their 20s and 30s right now? Millennials, uh, 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 Gen Z. Right? What, what, how should they take advantage of insurance right now, especially if they don't have an opportunity to really max fund it? What, what, or what, what type of strategy would you suggest they, they follow? If, if they can set aside 500 bucks or more a month and they do this into their own and max funded insurance contract that can be structured right, 
Um, that would be far better than that same $500, $1,000 a month going into any IRA or 401k you could show me. I mean, if their employer's matching, I wish the employers would match uh, if they put it into this, because this would be far better, but they could still deduct it. But nonetheless, a lot of employers don't know about this, but I would recommend people do that. And, and if, uh, if you, if you have ears to hear this, oh, here we I would take out an index universal life on my parents. If they're in their fifties, sixties or seventies, because I told my kids, listen, I have some insurance capacity I'm not using. I want you to all own a million dollar policy on dad. And by doing that, they can then put money in. And I showed them examples, putting in 600, 700 bucks a month into a million dollar policy, minimum funding. Now I'm no. not immortal. If I die anytime, if I die anytime in the next 10 or 20 years, they will immediately be a millionaire tax-free. They can take that million and then re put it into an insurance contract on their own life that will generate a hundred thousand dollars a year of tax-free income. You show me any IRA or 401k that comes close to doing that. See, it doesn't matter when I die. If they own one on me, they immediately get a million bucks anytime between now and when I, whenever I die. You show an IRA, you show me an IRA or 401k. It would take 35, 40 years earning 12% in an IRA or 401k to end up with a million bucks net after tax.